Drug overdose is a nationwide epidemic that claims the lives of over 36,000 Americans every year. In Georgia, overdose deaths more than tripled from 1999 to 2013. This increase is mostly driven by prescription opioids such as OxyContin and Hydrocodone, which now account for more overdose deaths than heroin and cocaine combined. In Georgia, the number of prescription overdose deaths increased 10% from 2009 to 2010. Opioid overdose, whether caused by heroin or prescription opioids, is typically reversible through the timely administration of naloxone, a safe and effective medication that reverses the effects of opioids and the provision of other emergency care. Recognizing that fatal and non-fatal overdoses from opioids play an increasing role in the mortality and morbidity of Georgia residents, Georgia became the 15th state to enact the 911 amnesty law, which allows non-medical first responders to carry and administer naloxone to someone experiencing opioid drug overdose. This training, developed by Georgia Department of Public Health, Office of EMS, and Office of Nursing, is an example of a DPH-approved training, but is by no means the only program available to instruct laypeople on the indication and the use of naloxone. This is a one-time training course, meaning participants are not subject to recertification to be able to perform functions as a carrier or administrator of naloxone. For more information about approved training curriculum standards for this subject, go to www.dph.georgia.gov and click on the EMS webpage or search for naloxone in the search engine. The goal of this 45-minute educational training is to help equip law enforcement and non-medical first responders with the knowledge and skills to know how to respond if they encounter someone experiencing opioid overdose. This training is broken into six segments and will include national and state overdose statistics, key components of the Georgia 911 amnesty law, overview of what an opioid is and how to recognize an opioid overdose, information about naloxone and how to administer it in intranasal or auto-injector form, and step-by-step -step instructions for the entire response. The overarching message for this educational training is that opioid overdose is both preventable and, if witnessed, treatable. Drug overdose rates have risen steadily in the United States since 1970, but as you see in Figure 1, the epidemic really started to take shape in the 90s. In fact, today's overdose death rates are roughly five times what they were in 1990. Drug overdose is now the leading cause of injury-related deaths in the United States, with over 40,000 deaths occurring in 2013. As this applies to opioid analgesics, or prescription painkillers, in Figure 2, this translates to about 44 deaths per day in the United States. Drugs now kill more people than motor vehicle accidents in the United States, a monumental shift that reflects gains in road safety amid a troubling rise in prescription drug abuse. This is the first time that drugs have caused more deaths than motor vehicle accidents since the government started tracking drug-related deaths in 1979. It also reflects two different important but separate trends, which is that safer cars, speed limits, and seatbelt laws have led to the decrease in motor vehicle death rates. On the other hand, we've seen a fairly steep rise in drug-related deaths, and the rise is mostly due to drug overdose. The increase in drug overdose death rates is linked with several factors, including a trend towards overprescribing painkillers in the clinical setting. Because opioids are legal with a prescription, there is sometimes a false assumption among patients that they are safe and can be increased as tolerated and combined with other drugs or alcohol. Multi-sourcing, or doctor shopping, to obtain additional prescriptions for controlled substances has also been a factor in the overabundance of legally obtained narcotics, as well as an abundance of access on the black market. To help resolve this problem, Georgia implemented a prescription drug monitoring program in 2012, and it's worth mentioning that although opioid overdose remains an issue for our state, Georgia ranks below U.S. average for drug poisoning deaths. While much attention has been given to deaths involving opioid analgesics, in recent years there have been a steady increase in the number of drug poisoning deaths involving heroin. While the CDC report only looked at the statistics and not the reasons behind the trend, experts believe people who are addicted to painkillers are switching to heroin, which is cheaper and offers a faster high. 
Plus, there have been efforts to regulate painkillers in the recent years, and in some cases, drug manufacturers are changing formulas to make their medications harder to abuse. So the widely applied theory is that the trend of the heroin showing up more in rural areas as well as inner cities supports the idea that prescription drug abusers are turning to heroin. And in fact, a recent study using data from 28 states reported that the death rate for heroin overdose doubled from 2010 to 2012. Looking at the breakdown of overdose by gender, men are more likely to die from prescription opioid overdose, but the mortality gap between men and women is closing. However, there is a significant gender gap when it comes to heroin. As you see in the chart above, in 2013, heroin overdose deaths were nearly four times higher in men than women. However, this is still a significant increase in overdose deaths among women. About 18 women die of prescription painkiller overdose in the United States every day, which is more than 6,600 deaths in 2010. Prescription painkiller overdoses are an underrecognized and a growing problem for women. Who is at risk for overdose is a pretty large umbrella and depends in part by the opioid in question and if it is legally prescribed or not. People dependent on opioids or with a history of substance abuse are groups at the highest risk for overdose. This may include individuals who have a legal prescription for acute or chronic pain and take high daily doses. This also includes chronic users who experience a reduced tolerance following detoxification, such as a release from incarceration or secession after a treatment for pain. Other at-risk groups include male gender, older age, multiple prescriptions including benzodiazepines, mental health conditions like depression and schizophrenia, or medical comorbidities such as HIV, hepatitis, and other liver disease and lung disease. Access to opioid antagonists and other emergency treatment is often limited by laws that make it difficult for those likely to be in a position to reverse an overdose and discourages witnesses and bystanders from calling for help. Additionally, in some cases, first responders dispatched to overdose calls often do not carry naloxone and are not trained in its use. In an attempt to reverse the unprecedented increase in preventable overdose deaths, a number of states have recently amended state laws to increase access to emergency care and treatment for opioid overdose. Since 2001, various states across the country have amended their laws to expand access to opioid antagonist drugs, and in some cases, adding Good Samaritan provisions in the law to make it easier for medical professionals to prescribe and dispense naloxone for laypersons to administer without fear of legal repercussions. In 2014, Georgia joined their ranks with the Georgia 911 Medical Amnesty Law. HB 965 was signed into law by Governor Nathan Deal and became effective on April 24, 2014. The law sets out to expand the access to opioid antagonists such as naloxone to EMS and first responder personnel, as well as to the general public. In addition, the law also provides immunity for those administering the drug, as well as those seeking medical assistance from drug overdose. Additionally, state law is amended to permit EMS personnel, such as EMTs, cardiac technicians, and paramedics to administer naloxone. Under the law, physicians licensed to practice in Georgia are authorized to prescribe opioid antagonists to certain individuals and entities for use in accordance with a physician protocol. These entities include first responders, who are defined by law as any person or agency who provides on-site care until the arrival of a duly licensed ambulance service, and includes persons who routinely respond to calls for assistance through an affiliation with law enforcement agencies, fire departments, and rescue agencies. The law permits these first responders to provide or administer naloxone for the purpose of saving the life of a person experiencing an opioid-related overdose. In addition to the first responder community, physicians may also prescribe naloxone for the use to a family member, friend, or person in a position to assist a person at risk of an opioid overdose, as well as to pain management clinics and harm reduction coalitions. A pharmacist acting in good faith may dispense opioid antagonists pursuant to a physician's prescription to anyone who has been properly prescribed the medication. Thus, with a valid prescription in hand, 
any person acting in good faith and in accordance with the protocol specified by the prescribing provider is authorized under the law to administer an opioid antagonist. In addition to expanding the access to opioid antagonists, HB 965 also includes immunity provisions in the law to protect those who are now authorized to prescribe, dispense, and administer the drug, as well as an amnesty provision to protect those seeking medical assistance. Under the law, a physician, pharmacist, and person administering naloxone are immune from civil, criminal, and professional liability as long as they act in good faith and in compliance with the applicable standard of care. An important amnesty provision of the law also provides limited immunity from arrest, charges, and prosecution for a drug violation for individuals who seek medical care in good faith for a person experiencing an overdose and for those who experience a drug overdose and are in need of medical care themselves if the evidence of the drug violation resulted solely from the seeking of medical assistance. Such persons are also relieved from penalties for violations of protective and restraining orders and violations of conditions of pretrial release, probation, and parole if such penalties are related to the seeking of medical assistance. According to the World Health Organization, opioids, which can be chemically synthesized or derived from the opium poppy plant, are a group of compounds that activate the brain's opioid receptors, a class of receptors that influence perceptions of pain and euphoria, and are involved in the regulation of breathing. Some of the more commonly known and used opioids are morphine, heroin, methadone, buprenorphine, codeine, tramadol, oxycodone, and hydrocodone. They are all used as medications to treat pain and opioid dependence. If used in excess or without proper medical supervision, opioids can cause fatal respiratory depression. Whether they are pharmaceutically produced or made in home laboratories, narcotics are drugs produced from a base of opium. In the next few slides, I will show examples of both legal prescription opiate drugs as well as illegal opiate street drugs, but they are in the same class. Opioids get their name from opium, a chemical in the opium poppy plant, which is refined to make heroin and opium. Opioid medications are now available manufactured, and a large number of synthetic and semi-synthetic opiate drugs are now available. Opioids work by binding to specific receptors in the brain, spinal cord, and GI tract. In doing so, they minimize the body's perception of pain. However, stimulating the pain receptors or reward centers in the brain can also trigger other body systems, such as those responsible for regulating mood, breathing, and blood pressure. The two most common forms of narcotic drugs are morphine and codeine. Both are synthesized from opium for medicinal use. And as I said before, the most commonly used drug for recreational purposes created from opium is heroin. Synthesized drugs created with an opium base for use in pain management are fentanyl, oxycodone, tramadol, demerol, hydrocodone, methadone, and hydromorphone, just to name a few. And new drugs are always coming out on the market. The pictures here show some common locations for placing transdermal fentanyl patches, which is something that you might want to look for if you think that you've come upon someone who's experiencing an opioid overdose. And as you know, the recreational use of opioids is illegal in the United States. Misuse of opioids can include giving the medication to people who it's not prescribed for, crushing or administering the medication by a route other than which it was prescribed, or it can be illicit forms made from home laboratories. The most common illicit opioid is heroin, and it is also the most difficult addiction to overcome. So how do you know if it's an opioid overdose? Let's take a look at some of the clinical signs and symptoms of opioid overdose and indications for the use of naloxone as a life-saving measure. Common side effects of opioid administration include sleepiness, dizziness, nausea, vomiting, constipation, physical dependence, tolerance, and respiratory depression. The most common side effect of opioid usage are constipation and nausea. Opioid overdose happens when a toxic amount of an opioid, alone or mixed with other opioids, drugs and or substances, overwhelms the body's ability to handle it. 
Due to their effect on the part of the brain which regulates breathing, opioids in high doses can cause respiratory depression and death. An opioid overdose can be identified by the combination of three signs and symptoms referred to as the opioid overdose triad. These symptoms of the triad are pinpoint pupils, unconsciousness, and respiratory depression. And here's a diagram of the opioid overdose triad. Uh, and again, those symptoms are pinpoint pupils, unconsciousness, and respiratory depression. In cases of fatal overdose, the victim's breathing slows to the point where oxygen levels in the blood fall below the level needed to maintain function of vital organs. Oxygen levels in the blood are typically 97% or higher, but as soon as levels start falling below 86%, the brain struggles to function. Typically, the individual becomes unresponsive, blood pressure starts to drop, heart rate slows, and ultimately stops. But often, prior to death, there is a longer period of unresponsiveness, lasting up to several hours. This period sometimes is associated with loud snoring, which is called agonal respirations. A number of risk factors are associated with both fatal and non-fatal overdoses. Opioid availability, opioid overdose rates are associated with the increased availability of opioids, both illicit and prescribed. This was illustrated in the first few slides. The increase in prescribing rates of opioids in the United States appears to have contributed to the increase in cases of opioid-related overdose. Some risk factors include mixing different types of drugs like opioids with alcohol and benzodiazepines, quality and difference in purity levels based off batch, low tolerance due to not using opioids after an incarceration, detox, or drug-free drug treatment environment, compromised health due to an infection or lack of sleep, or using a loan behind a locked door where you are unable to be found. In addition to the risk factors previously mentioned, there are certain types of prescription and over-the-counter medications that, when mixed with opioids, have a synergistic effect. This is the type of drug interaction which magnifies the power and potency of the chemical, making side effects much stronger than the opioid would ever produce on its own, which can be dangerous. In cases of fatal opioid overdose, the combination of opioids with other sedating psychoactive substances, especially alcohol and benzodiazepines, seem to play an especially significant role. What leads to overdose death is lack of sufficient oxygen in the blood after the brain stops telling the central nervous system to breathe. This is called respiratory failure. Soon vital organs, like the heart and brain, start to fail, leading to unconsciousness, coma, and death. Which is why making that 911 call as soon as possible is so critical to the health and survival of an overdose victim. Naloxone, a medication known by the brand name Narcan, is an antagonist for opioids, which means that it blocks drugs like heroin and hydrocodone from exerting their effect in the brain. When naloxone is administered, opioids are rapidly forced out of brain receptors, so the fatal effects of opioid overdose most notably the suppression of breathing, are reversed as a result. The medication lasts 30 to 90 minutes. In this section, we will cover what you need to know about the drug's pharmacology and how it acts inside the body to reverse an otherwise fatal overdose. Naloxone was developed in the 1960s and was especially used in emergency rooms during the heroin epidemic of that period. Naloxone was approved by the FDA in 1971 and has been used safely for over 40 years with few major side effects. Successful pilot programs for outside of the hospital setting began to gain attention in 1996 due to the continual rise of opioid-related deaths. Although these pilots, which were mostly conducted in large metropolitan cities, were successful in reducing deaths from overdose, the program had several limitations, including extensive training and the risk of infection from handling of syringes. Improvements in technology for pharmaceutical administration have largely resolved those issues, and in August 2013, the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration, or SAMHSA, introduced the Opioid Overdose Toolkit, a federal resource promoting safety and prevention information for people at risk for overdose. 
SAMHSA updated its opioid overdose toolkit in August 2014 and now recommends that healthcare professionals should consider prescribing naloxone along with the patient's initial opioid prescription. Naloxone can be administered intravenously, as is done by a medical professional, or injected intramuscularly or sprayed intranasally, both of which can be easily done by a trained layperson. Naloxone is often dispensed in a rescue kit that includes a delivery device, which is a needle or nasal atomizer and syringe, and items such as alcohol swabs, non-latex gloves, and a plastic face shield for rescue breathing, along with information cards on things such as opioid overdose response and naloxone administration, along with overdose prevention tips and substance use disorder treatment. It is important to note that naloxone concentrations do vary based on route for which they are intended to be administered. Naloxone may be injected into the muscle, vein, or under the skin, or sprayed into the nose. Naloxone that is injected into the muscle, vein, or under the skin comes in a lower concentration, which is 0.4 mg per milliliter, than naloxone which is sprayed up the nose, which is 2 mg per 2 milliliters. It is a temporary drug that wears off within 20 to 90 minutes. In this training, we will only be covering the two naloxone delivery devices that are considered safe for non-medical responders, which are the intranasal form and the intramuscular autoinjector. The neurochemistry of an opioid addiction is complicated, but the reversal of overdose using naloxone is a fairly straightforward process. Opioids are powerful chemicals because they mimic natural neurotransmitters in the brain, which can relieve pain and suffering, and they also reduce the perception of pain and stimulate pleasure and a sense of well-being. Opioids are effective because they resemble a type of chemical messenger naturally found in the brain and spinal cord. These neurotransmitters, called endorphins, do two things. They block pain transmission by binding to the opioid receptors of specialized nerve cells, and they promote euphoria by binding to cells in the reward center of the brain. When external opioids are taken in large amounts, receptors are overwhelmed in the part of the brain that controls breathing, an area called the medulla oblongata. Breathing rates slow to a critical level and then stop. Death follows if prompt medical attention is not rendered once respiratory arrest has occurred. The science behind naloxone is relatively simple. An opioid antagonist, naloxone has a stronger affinity and binds to the receptor site, displaces the opiate, and takes its place in the binding site. After administration of naloxone, normal breathing returns within a matter of minutes. The opiate, once it has been displaced from the opioid receptor, is kept at bay while the naloxone occupies the binding site. The effect of naloxone peaks within two to five minutes and lasts from 30 to 90 minutes. It is important that medical assistance is summoned when naloxone is used because a positive response may be short-lived. Many opioids like methadone and extended release oxycodone and hydrocodone are longer acting and may require repeated or increased doses of naloxone and many opioid overdoses involve alcohol and other drugs that are not responsive to naloxone. These instances in which naloxone may not work immediately or fails to reverse an overdose requires that bystanders institute rescue breathing and call a universal access number such as 911 for assistance. Remember that naloxone is a regulated medicine that must be obtained from a licensed provider. It's important to check the expiration date of naloxone before administering. When storing, avoid exposure to extreme heat and keep out of light. If there are no contraindications, the intranasal form is the optimal choice. If possible, ask bystanders about history of seizures and details about substance injected, ingested, inhaled, or if there is a transdermal patch that has been used. Assessing the scene for drug use clues may be helpful in determining what substances were consumed. This information helps guide medical professionals in assessing further treatment needs. It is rare for someone to die immediately from an overdose. It is usually a slow-ish process that takes anywhere from a few minutes to a few hours. When people survive, it's because someone was there to respond. The most important thing is to act right away. This section outlines the basics of responding to an opioid overdose. In the next few slides, we will go over the step-by-step -step instructions for how to respond to an overdose situation in a safe and timely manner 
and includes instructions for the administration of naloxone by way of intranasal atomizer or intramuscular autoinjector. Please note that there are two adjoining videos in this training, developed by the Georgia Department of Public Health, which provide an actual demonstration of the step-by-step -step process, so you can see how to set up and administer both forms of naloxone in a real-life event. It is recommended that you call 911 in the case of an overdose because it is important to have a trained medical professional assess the condition of an overdosing person. Even though naloxone can fix the overdose, there may be other health problems going on. Also, people who survive any type of overdose are at a risk of experiencing other complications as a result of the overdose, such as pneumonia and other heart problems. Remember, naloxone only works if there are opioids involved with the overdose. It cannot reverse an overdose from cocaine, speed, benzodiazepines, alcohol, and other non-opioid-based drugs. Step two is to check for clinical signs of opioid overdose, which can sometimes be a bit challenging to differentiate from other medical emergencies at first glance. This is a list of some of the primary signs and symptoms of opioid overdose. A decreased rate and depth of breathing, or difficulty in labored breathing occurs, and breaths may become accompanied by sounds of gurgling or deep snoring, which is sometimes known as agonal respirations. This depression of the respiratory system is usually the cause of death from an overdose. As a result of the lack of oxygen, the victim's skin becomes blue, especially around the lips, and the victim's body will also feel cold and clammy. Another sign of overdose is a loss of alertness and drowsiness that can sometimes cause the overdose person to temporarily fall asleep or have a complete loss of consciousness that can be accompanied by seizures. Another important thing to do is to open up the victim's eyelids to check and see if the person has pinpoint pupils, which is a classic sign of opioid overdose, and may also be helpful in differentiating an overdose from some other medical conditions like hypoglycemia, which can also cause a loss of consciousness in extreme cases. So let's back up for a second and put steps one, two, and three together, because it's this process together that should ultimately guide you in making the decision to administer an opioid reversal agent. If you come upon someone who is non-responsive and a possible victim of overdose, try to make a vigorous effort to arouse the victim. Yell the victim's name if you know it. You can also apply a painful but non-injurious stimulus to the victim's body. One way to do this, it consists of rubbing your knuckles across the victim's sternum or breastbone. If the victim still does not respond, check to see how he or she is breathing. If the victim is not breathing, it is urgent to get medical help as soon as possible, so call 911 first even before rescue efforts are attempted if no one else is around. Be sure to tell the dispatcher that the victim may have overdosed and is not breathing, as this makes the call a priority and help will arrive as soon as possible. If the victim is breathing, you can briefly leave the victim to make the call, but be sure to place the victim on their left side to prevent choking. This is called the recovery position and will be described shortly. It is critical to then perform mouth-to-mouth -mouth breathing, which is also called rescue breathing, as soon as possible to get oxygen into the victim's vital organs. If the victim is still not breathing or regaining consciousness after these efforts, then naloxone must be used. The image on the screen shows you how to perform rescue breathing. Begin by tilting the victim's head back with one hand while using two fingers by the other hand to lift the chin up. This ensures that the airway is open. Then quickly check the mouth, both by sight and by a sweep of a finger, to see that it's free of anything that might be blocking the airway. Next, pinch the nose and cover the victim's mouth with yours for an airtight seal. If a mouth shield is available, this should be used. Start rescue breathing by giving the victim two full breaths and watching them for the victim's chest to rise. If the chest does not rise, then retilt the head and try again then determine if the victim is beginning to breathe on his own. You will need to look, listen, and feel for breathing in order to determine whether the victim is breathing. In addition to watching for the chest to rise, this involves feeling for air and hearing the breathing from the mouth. Continue giving one breath every five seconds while checking to see whether the individual begins breathing on his own. Note that rescue breathing consists of breathing for the victim and it is that component of cardiopulmonary resuscitation, or CPR, 
However, rescue breathing is different from what is done in CPR in the sense that manual chest compressions are not needed here. We now ask that you pause this recording to review the two adjoining videos, which show a demonstration of the administration of naloxone through both the intranasal and auto-injector route of administration. Now that you've watched the two video demonstrations, let's talk a little bit more about the advantages or disadvantages of these different routes of administration. The intranasal route of administering naloxone is effective in managing most overdoses, although overdoses that involve higher potency opioids may not respond well. Note that victims do not have to be breathing to allow intranasal naloxone to work as it is administered by an atomizer that coats the nasal passages and allows the drug to be absorbed into the bloodstream and go right to the brain. The rationale for using an intranasal application involves its safety and its ease of use. There is a much lower risk of accidental transmission of bloodborne infectious diseases that can result from a needle stick. Most laypersons also find using an intranasal device easier than a needle to use. Naloxone by the intranasal route is also more slowly absorbed, so it is less likely to result in the overdose victim having opioid withdrawal symptoms. One issue with intranasal naloxone is the need to obtain the intranasal applicator and atomizer, which are not sold in most pharmacies. The naloxone autoinjector is the only FDA-approved formulation for in-home use in cases where there is a known or suspected opioid overdose, and a recent study showed that even with no training at all, 90% of laypersons were able to administer it correctly in this form. The retracting needle offers the added advantage of reducing needle stick risk. The greatest and perhaps the only disadvantage to the autoinjector is the cost although many private insurances do cover a portion of the consumer price. Naloxone only lasts between 30 and 90 minutes, while the effects of opioids may last much longer. It is possible that after the naloxone wears off, overdose could reoccur. This is why it's so important for someone to stay with the person after an overdose and monitor clinical signs that may indicate that another dose of naloxone is necessary. Also, naloxone can cause uncomfortable withdrawal feelings since it blocks the action of opioids in the brain. On rare occasions, nausea, vomiting, hypertension, pulmonary edema, tachycardia, or arrhythmia have been reported following naloxone administration. If you have to leave the person that you've just given naloxone to, put them in the recovery position by rolling them over slightly onto their side, bending the top knee, and then putting the top hand over their head to support it just like you see in the picture here. This position should keep the person from rolling onto his or her stomach or back and so they don't choke if he or she vomits. It is recommended that you watch the person for at least one hour or until emergency medical services arrive in case the person goes back into overdose. You may need to give the person more naloxone if this happens. Give a second dose if the person does not respond after three minutes. If an overdose victim revives, keep the person calm. Tell the person that the drugs are still in his or her system and that the naloxone will wear off in 30 to 45 minutes. Recommend that the person seek medical attention and assist him or her if necessary. Brain damage can occur after three to five minutes without oxygen, so remember that rescue breathing is one of the most important things that you can do to prevent someone from dying from an opioid overdose. So again, the steps for responding to an overdose are, one, call for help by dialing 911, two, check for signs of an opioid overdose, three, support the person's breathing, four, administer naloxone, and five, monitor the person's response to the administration of naloxone. Thank you for attending the First Responder Naloxone Administration and Georgia 911 Medical Amnesty Law course developed by Georgia Department of Public Health. My name is Jennifer Burkholder and I'm one of the co-developers of this training and had the pleasure of narrating this training for you today. I hope that you never find yourself in a situation where you have to administer naloxone to an overdose victim, but I'm confident that you'll know what to do, and I'm grateful that you have taken the time to educate yourself to become an opioid overdose responder. This concludes the training, 
and curriculum requirements to administer naloxone as a layperson or a Good Samaritan in the state of Georgia. Thank you.